everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we are finally doing a video that has been long teased about on my channel. Today we are going to look at sexinchrist.com. And I haven't navigated to the website yet because I want it to be a reveal. I want it to be a surprise because even just the front page is an experience. So I just want to say before we get into this, because I don't like talk about religion on my channel at all. I was raised Catholic. Most of my family is still fairly religious. I do consider myself to kind of be an atheist. I just, I don't really feel strongly about religion. I'm not like militantly like anti-theist. I don't think religion is stupid. I don't think you're stupid if you get something out of religion or if religion is important to you. We are not here to make fun of religious people. Also, there's a weed whacker outside, so I apologize if you hear that as well, but we're not here to make fun of religious people. We are here to enjoy just a complete experience of a website, okay? That's just what we're here to do. We're not here to put anyone down. We're here to have fun. So, with all that being said, let's go over to sexinchrist.com. All right, so they're just going to weed whack outside this whole time. I guess, great timing. But we're just going to go into it because this website does not stop for anything. So, this is, I'm not kidding you, this is the homepage. There's just anal sex in accordance with God's will. Let's just... I'm not, the format is the way that it is. I have not modified this in any way. It is edge to edge, wall to wall text about anal. So let's see what it says here. Are you saving yourself for your wedding night? The devil wants you to fail. That's why he puts stumbling blocks in your way. But God wants you to succeed. And that's why he has given us an alternative to intercourse before marriage. Anal sex. <laughs> Through anal sex, you can satisfy your body's needs while you avoid the risk of unwanted pregnancy and still keep yourself pure for marriage. You may be shocked at first by this idea. Isn't anal sex sodomy forbidden by the Bible? Isn't anal sex dirty? What's the difference between having anal sex before marriage and having regular intercourse. Let's address these issues by debunking some myths about anal sex and God's will. First of all, I love that this is the front page. Like, listen, priority number one is we gotta tell all the people saving it for marriage that anal is God's loophole. That is something that I heard from people that were non-religious in my life growing up. Like, I had boyfriends that joked about, like, God's loophole or whatever, even though that they were you know, raised without religion. I never heard this growing up. I never heard about anal sex being the alternative to vaginal sex. I mean, all the messaging you get in religious circles, I think, is really around. Uh, well, it depends. I, I both have heard people that, you know, it's it's about purity of, like, intention and, and purity. Like, people don't even kiss before marriage. I knew somebody that did that. They didn't even kiss before they got married. Like, they, they take it to a really far place. Whereas other people, it's just penis in vagina and anything else is pretty much okay and that is certainly the direction <laughs> they are going to go in here now obviously i don't think that anal sex is dirty in any kind of like spiritual sense it's all really people's ideas about you know anal and i think you know a little bit of homophobia as well it's not like like literally dirty now for for their part they do say the bible says to the pure, all things are pure. Depending on how you interpret that, that can mean a lot of things. The Lord created your body and no part of it is imperfect or unclean. God also created our bodies for pleasure and anal sex is just one of the many ways, including standard sexual intercourse, that we can enjoy this pleasure and share it with a partner. So listen, God certified anal sex. He made your butt to be a center for pleasure. That is why he made the prostate. Now, I don't know if the prostate is mentioned in this. I don't see the word prostate anywhere, just like speed reading through this. But I mean, if we want a biblical explanation, 
for anal sex, why did God make the prostate? I think we need to have a section in here where we talk about the godliness of pegging because that is not part of of this discussion. That, that, that needs to be included in this. Uh, you know, but that this, this section on anal, this is just the beginning. We can go so many other places, which I have sinned. I am sorry to say I have sinned. I have looked at a few of these web pages before, but don't worry, we're gonna explore the rest together. So, obviously, there's fisting in God's will, there's bondage in Christ, a philosophical argument for masturbation, which is new, and threesomes within a Christian marriage. Now, I have made this joke before, but I will repeat it. Why is Girl Defined and all of the other Christian influencers on YouTube, why are they not telling us about the godliness of threesomes within a Christian marriage? People need to know their options. Sometimes God thinks that you don't have to be sexually monogamous to a partner. Sometimes there are alternatives and we need to know about this. But obviously because my channel is about BDSM, we have to know about bondage in Christ. Now, again, being raised Catholic, I can tell you there's a lot of very um, kinky imagery within the Catholic church. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm not saying there could be alternative uses for confessional but there certainly could be and i wish more people would implement the practice of confessions in their ds relationships <laughs> i'm not gonna read all of this because this is literally a whole essay and a half but we're gonna we're just gonna we're gonna we're just gonna go through it okay so it starts out by saying there has been an ongoing debate in the christian community about whether or not christians can engage in bdsm practices without sinning that's the important part can't have sin no sin only holy bdsm only things that will bring you closer to god although bdsm can involve literal bondage and discipline it is best understood as a metaphorical relationship oh mm -hmm. we're getting metaphysical with it we're getting metaphorical with it a relationship between husband and wife and in terms of spiritual submission, which is an important theme in the New Testament. Okay, I think this is kind of getting at it from the same angle as um, Christian domestic discipline people do, which I'm not gonna get into that, but I will briefly say what I have seen of it. It does seem to be like 50-50 people that want to do BDSM, but want to have a really good Christian reason for doing it. And so it's primarily led by the wife or the submissive partner, and they really want to have that discipline in the relationship, or it's kind of condoned in the community and is a way to sort of enable abuse within like spousal relationships in uh you know those marriages and i i don't necessarily want to endorse that or give that the okay especially because there are very different ideas about consent and revoking consent and communication and negotiation which is essentially you're the wife now i do what I want to because I am the spiritual head of the household, you know? So anyways, again, not getting into that in really any level of detail, but I have heard very mixed things that range from basically just BDSM to basically just kind of abusive. So continuing on here, uh, a BDSM relationship between a dominant husband and submissive wife is actually the ideal of marriage set out in, I can never pronounce this, Ephistians? Listen, a fistians, okay? That is where we get fisting in a godly Christian marriage. <laughs> I think it's Ephesians, actually. I don't remember. I'm sorry. I uh, have not had to pronounce the names of books in a while. So, uh, yes. So, taken to its logical conclusion. Tell me more. I Please, if somebody is somebody's getting into theology, if you're getting a degree in theology, please, please use this as a subject for one of, of your writings. I need, I need this. All right. So what it says is, uh, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, 
cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. Uh, beautiful, beautiful stuff there. So, so the explanation for how this connects to BDSM appears to be the husband and wife who choose to enter into a consensual, dominant, submissive relationship. Uh, they said consensual. Okay. All right. Are choosing to fully enact this commandment in their sexual life. A choice that is valid and honorable and may bring them both deep sexual and spiritual fulfillment. BDSM, practiced responsibly, can be a tool of growth for both partners in a Christian marriage as it allows them to more fully explore God's plan for spiritual and sexual partnership. Interesting. Uh, is it just... Okay, I have a question though. Is it just for people like submissive wives and, and dominant husbands? Because that is obviously limiting. And how do you work in pegging? into that type of dynamic that is the i'm just going to keep saying it. that is the article i need i need guidance about the use of the prostate because i think that's a question a lot of people are going to have <laughs> okay well okay i was just scrolling and I, we have to read this bdsm does not necessarily involve whips or chains true black leather or dungeon gear sometimes the leather is pink although if they find these props help them get in a good mood okay wait I just had, imagine a dungeon that goes along with the colors of the, 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 okay, I don't know if other denominations do this, but in Catholicism, there's like different colors that the priests will wear throughout the times of the year that go through the Christian Bible, right? Where there's like Easter, there's Lent, there's Advent, like there, there's all of those different little subtle changes. Imagine if you had a BDSM dungeon or leather gear that matched with the colors of the part of the year that you were in. That's how you make it. Christian BDSM. Or at least Catholic. I don't know. <laughs> There's no not reason why Christians should not use them. There's nothing sinful about these items. In fact, they are part of the Christian heritage. Oh, are we getting into uh, self-flagellation? Are we getting into that? The ye olde. The ye olde solo BDSM. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I beat my body and bring it into submission for fear that by any means that after I have preached to others, I myself should be rejected. Many SM devices, such as floggers, whips, clamps, chastity belts, and the cat and nine tails bear close resemblance to used a wide array of devices, and that phrasing is weird, early Christian penitents to whip their bodies and mortify their flesh. This is, this is legit. Well, I can verify the history book I have read about BDSM does in fact talk about this. And in fact, you can't even to this day buy implements online for self-flagellation that are uh, typically very mean compared to a lot of nice fluffy BDSM gear. So that is very much a thing you can do. Despite the misleading impressions that such common BDSM practices as spanking, humiliation, and name calling may give, they are only performed in the context of a loving relationship to fulfill the higher purpose of strengthening emotional, sexual, and spiritual bonds. Just as we trust the Lord, the submissive partner offers total trust to the dominant partner, knowing that the end results will be redemption and satisfaction. Let him submit absolutely there may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who strikes it and receive his fill of insults. First of all, I love the literal interpretations of every portion of scripture in this, but like, this is like compared to a lot of other approaches to kink where it's like trying to do something that's kind of like BDSM in like a Christian religious context. Like they talk about consent. They talk about how you know, this is done, I, I, you know, I don't think loving is necessarily required, but it's a re mutually respecting relationship where there is the ideal of it being because at the end of it, you're going to be better than what you came in with. You're going to get emotional fulfillment, sexual fulfillment, like that, that is part of it. And so like, I, you know, I'm surprised I kind of get it, you know, like it's not all that, it's not all that bad. Okay. Okay. This is the big question though. Can a man be submissive to his wife? This is a tricky question 
but a very important one that needs to be addressed. We believe that a man can adopt a submissive and servile role and allow his wife to dominate him sexually. If it is absolutely clear that outside of the bedroom, the husband is the spiritual head of the marriage. Just as a woman gives the gift of submission to her husband, there is no reason why for their mutual sexual gratification, a man should not submit his body to his wife for her use and serve her sexually. This is totally in alignment with the biblical command that husband and wife give each other due benevolence. Her body is meant for his sexual enjoyment and vice versa. All right. I don't always hear that every day. But okay. However, this reversal of roles in the context of sexual relations is only possible due to the sanctity of the marital bed and an explicit understanding on the parts of both the husband and wife that they will adopt natural roles <laughs> in the rest of their daily lives. We would counsel against couples living the wife dominant husband submissive roles 24 seven, as this could lead to spiritual confusion. Listen, spiritual confusion is the name of my new goth rock band, but I, <laughs> they tried. Okay, they're like, listen, we can only do so much with the text. It doesn't say that a man can be submissive 24 seven, but he can enjoy being submissive in the bedroom. And I don't love it, but it is somehow more understanding than a lot of Christian approaches to thoughts about kink and, and men being submissive at all in any context. And, uh, you know, mutual due benevolence, mutual pleasure, mutual sexual satisfaction and enjoyment. That is, you know, that's dang near progressive. All right. What else? Okay, do we do... Do we do fisting in God's will? Or... or oh, There's so many options. I can't... I could be on this website for forever, but I don't want this to be like an hour long, so... I feel like the oral one would be creepy, so that's gonna be a no. Okay, whoa, okay. Wait, there's reader question and answers. Alright. I'm gonna open up a couple of these. And we're gonna like... Do like a lightning round kind of a deal, maybe. Alright. Um, let's do fisting in God's will. Oh, whoa, the fist of might. Okay, this might be a very, another very literal section here. I don't see why, oh, I see. It's because fisting is often mistakenly associated with the gay community, and so it's considered too extreme to be appropriate. Okay, I, I don't, I can't, I, okay, okay, I get it. Uh, but you can do vaginal fisting like that's a thing that people do <laughs> now we're gonna get into biblical references to fists I, okay this sounds like it might be a little bit of a stretch for this essay but we'll see over and over in the scriptures the hand and fist of god are described as a symbol of his awesome power and the means through which this power manifests oh god God of our ancestors, you are not God in heaven above the ruler and of all kingdoms below. You hold all power and might in your fist. I had to clarify, when you fist someone, you don't do this or this. It's more like a duck. It's more like this, you know, at least for most people. You know, you can't get to a point where you do ball it up. But for most people, it's more of a duck hand, like, like a duck bill mouth. And it is a, like punching someone on the inside, you know. So there's that. You're open, oh, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. <laughs> I don't think that meant opening your hand inside someone. I think that maybe was like providing the bounty of the earth through open, opening your hands and providing for all that needs something. But okay, okay. The biblical significance of the hand is important because the act of fisting, one partner, usually male, inserts his entire hand and fist into the vagina or rectum of his partner. Rather than copulating with his penis, he penetrates her with his fist, given the powerful symbolism of the fist. Okay, so they're saying this is like, because the man is the spiritual head of the household, and one of the important symbols 
of Christian theology is the power derived in God's hands, that means that when you fist someone, you are acting out in your power as the spiritual head of the Christian household. Is that, is that the line we're following here? Does that make sense? On a symbolic and sexual level, a wife who is fisted by her husband has the experience of surrendering completely to the divine love and power of God as embodied by her partner's hand. The husband in turn has the experience of touching and caressing her inwardly in such a deep and intimate manner as God touches our own souls and his grace. Beautiful. What a beautiful idea. Uh-oh, we're getting some Song of Solomon. We got some Song of Solomon alert. Okay, anyone, did anyone else, that, that part of the Bible got skipped when you were a kid, I imagine. Um, it is, it is the erotica part of the Bible, if you are yet unfamiliar with it. Mm. But it says, the act of fisting and the profound erotic bliss it induces. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. My love thrust his hand through the opening and my feelings were stirred for him. I would love to know the original Greek and Latin. Was it his hand? Is that literal the meaning? Or is it like, does that have a metaphorical meaning about hand? Uh, here we see the lover gradually or gently coaxing his companion to open up for him, metaphorically knocking on the door, knock, knock, preparing her sexually and emotionally to receive his hand inside her. Yep. Okay. Before attempting fisting, very important. A Christian husband and wife should pray together and ask for divine guidance. The husband should ask that God guide his hand, like literally, like into, like, okay, and work through him for the skill and patience to fist his wife correctly and maximize pleasure. The wife should pray for openness and readiness to receive God's love and grace in the form of her husband's hand. Listen, I love that. Every, before you do a scene, you got to pray and you got to be like, God, allow your power to flow through my hand such that my wife can feel God's grace through my fist inside her vagina. I love it. I love it. It's great. It's great stuff. All right. Like I said, we're doing a speed round. I can't do this for all day. Let's do threesomes in a Christian marriage. Can there be polyamory, open relationships in a Christian marriage? marriage is this a temptation into sin or a calling to a higher spiritual love the answer is not clear in all situations so we must turn to scripture for guidance ah yes of course as we have done many many a time previously oh i mean let's just go there's rules okay playing by god's rules let's if, on the other hand, a married couple feels their relationship would benefit from them establishing a loving involvement with another woman, no other man, just women, just listen, no homo, okay? No homo. Out of respect for the couple's marriage and out of respect for any marital attachments of the other woman, they must abide by certain limits and conditions. One, to avoid the impropriety of male homosexuality, a heterosexual couple should not under any circumstances form a threesome with another man. Okay. Two, both women involved in the threesome must be willing to keep within traditional female roles, not taking on masculine appearance or behavior in or out of the bedroom and recognize the male as the leader in the relationship. Three, if the wife's lesbian sex partner is unmarried, it may be permissible for the husband to have relationships or relations with her only with his wife's consent. Wait, but then she's not pure for her marriage. Wait, how does that work? I don't believe that. Number three is questionable. It's all questionable, but from a theological standpoint of what these people generally believe, I have questions. Four, if the wife's lesbian sex partner is unmarried, but the wife does not wish her to have relations with the other woman, the husband should respect this. Okay. Negotiate your boundaries. Okay. That's fine. Five. If the wife's lesbian sex partner is married, her husband must not have objections to the relationship. I mean, you know, open, honest communication. That's, that's agreeable. And finally, six. 
if the wife's lesbian sex partner, say that five times fast, is married, the husband should refrain from having any sexual relations with her and should make every effort to control his fantasies about her. He should concentrate his attention on his own wife. Okay, so this is basically saying um, the wife, you can have a lady for the sake of your wife's pleasure, but you can't do anything with her unless she's unmarried. That's fine. But it all has to be aware of and consented to, and it could be worse, I guess. I don't know. <sighs> to summarize, we feel a Christian threesome is morally acceptable if it meets these conditions. It must be composed of one man and two women, all of whom recognize and maintain proper sex roles for men and women in and out of the bedroom. Okay, so no pegging. I think we finally got the answer on that. Sorry, boys, no pegging. All married members of the threesome must consent to the arrangement. Wait. What about unmarried members? Do unmarried unmarried members need to consent also, I assume? And have consent from their spouses. And finally, the purpose of the relationship must be that it ultimately strengthens the existing bond between husband and wife and allows all three parties to share and celebrate their love of God together. I love the idea that the reason you're having a threesome is for a spiritual experience. Like, I mean, like, sex can be a spiritual experience for some people. I don't think they meant it like that. This is a very, like, the spirit of the law versus letter of the law. And, like, as long as it gets you closer to God, it's probably fine. God probably, I mean, he made bodies. He made, like, he made all these different genital arrangements. So why not see what happens when you put them all together, you know? All right, so for, for the final bit here, let's talk about reader questions and answers oh my goodness okay oh, okay this is like this is complete blasphemy you must take this down to suggest that the lord jesus christ propositioned a woman for a blow job is preposterous i mean we didn't read that part but i mean i know a lot of people that don't think blow jobs count as real sex so especially in that time period like Greeks, like, they had their, listen, different time periods, people had very different ideas about what, what constituted a sex act or not. I'm just, we haven't even brought up Mary Magdalene in this yet. Have we brought up the Mary Magdalene question? All right. You are sinning against God by twisting the words of his son. You need to take this down for your own good. We did not mean to suggest that Jesus was propositioning the woman at the well or asked her to give him a blowjob. Of course not. Jesus would never do that. I mean, if Christians can enjoy oral sex, why can't Jesus? In fact, he refuses to give her the living water himself. When she asks him to give her the living water, semen. Oh, that's what that means. Semen is is another kind of milk. I assume that was holy water, my bad. Christ tells the woman to get her husband. This is so he, Christ, could instruct her on how to give a blowjob to her husband. Whoa, whoa, Jesus is a sex educator. I had no idea. <laughs> and received the living water from her husband. Thank you for your concern and we, listen, listen, I would have to take this website down if I did suggest that Jesus propositioned a woman for a blowjob himself. But don't worry, he was only educating her on proper blowjob technique. Very different matters. <laughs> uh, listen, why are Christians against sex ed in schools? Or some Christians, sorry. Why are some Christians against sex ed in schools? Jesus did it. Jesus told people how to give blowjobs. Why can't you do it in school? Seems like to me, it could even be considered part of a proper theological upbringing. I've never read in my Bible where adultery is okay with the spouse's permission. This is disgusting. I would like to see you back up God permitting this with scripture. My Bible talks about relations between a man and man and a woman and woman being wrong. And that there is a unity between one man and one wife. Gosh dang it. The Bible is clear when it tells us, do not commit adultery. However, what is at issue here is the definition of adultery. In biblical times, wives were considered the property of their husbands, and the crime or sin of adultery was basically defined by one man violating another man's property rights. I mean, 
The wife was often considered culpable because in having sex with another man, she was defying her husband. This is why Old Testament kings could have hundreds of wives and concubines without being adulterers. Although they were married and had sex with many women, they weren't committing adultery because none of those women were married to other men. Oh, I see. On the other hand, if one of King David's hundreds of wives, for example, had a fling with a stable hand, they both could have been put to death. I mean, it seems pretty extreme, but those were the times. In these enlightened times, we no longer consider wives to be the property, although they are spiritually submissive to their husbands. Don't forget that part. Spiritually submissive, but not property. No, no OP relationships in a good Christian marriage. This is what we have learned. No owner property relationships. This definition of adultery is obsolete. Although the male is still considered to be the leader within the marriage and the family, the husband and wife are more or less equal partners. They must respect each other and anything that undermines this respect and trust undermines the marriage. However, if they are open and honest about their relationships with others, and there, if there is no jealousy or distrust created between them, then there is no cause for blame or guilt. I mean, really, it's just like good poly advice. You know, you don't, like, jealousy, you know, eh, you know, jealousy is a thing a lot of people have to deal with. But if you're open, if you're honest, if you go into it, being able to equally negotiate and navigate the parameters. Okay. So, in summary, this is an amazing website that I think is doing a lot <laughs> to, uh, you know, put a bee in people's bonnets about, you know, oh, marriage and one man and one woman and, and having sex before marriage is evil and what about anal it's too much like gay sex and blah 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 i appreciate anything uh that puts a bee in people's bonnets about those types of ideas so i am excited about this now i do i do just brief let's go over the bdsm in a christian marriage you know loving bondage and discipline uh, you know it can be you know it can be a loving a loving experience you know see look exactly see look of course we are not endorsing any sort of abuse or non-consensual violence bdsm is not wife beating or domestic violence there is a huge difference between punishment inflicted out of anger and cruelty by one person overpowering another and discipline that is meted out with love and reason gratefully and willingly received those who participate in bondage and discipline and sadomasochism do so of their own free will and by mutual agreement. And as with a dominant submissive relationship, it takes two to tango. Although it may seem like the person who ties the knots or wheels the paddle holds all the power. Oh, we're getting to this idea. If BDSM is practiced respectfully and ethically, the power is shared. The husband should always respect the limits of his wife with respect to pain or humiliation so that he does not inflict any real physical or emotional harm on her. You know what? Like, this website's kind of wackadoodle. Like, it's one person's passion project, clearly, and definitely, I think, trying to work their views about sex into a Christian worldview. But, like, it's about consent and respecting limits and and communication and not inflicting lasting harm on a partner you know obviously the gendered thing is an issue for me because you know um who cares about gender in 2022 let's just get over gender you know honestly uh you know why does it need to be a problem why can't we just you know everyone do everything i get it you know there's problems with it but i think as far as a lot of ideas that people spread about bdsm like this is certainly not you know the worst one out there everything being said which is saying quite a lot i think so i would love to know who made this website and why they made it and are they still making it because like this is like kind of an older formatted website um i can't really tell when things are from uh, you know it, it could be from yesterday it could be from 20 years ago i don't know my guess is it's probably within the last couple of years but I, I i honestly don't know it's you know it just it's a great experience i i am happy to have gone through this because where else are you going to get this kind of quality content that is everything i have for today you guys i would love to know your thoughts and opinions about this down below especially if you are somebody that is maybe christian yourself or you grew up christian your thoughts and feelings about this because i know there are a couple of you at least that are in my following that do bdsm 
within a Christian marriage. And maybe this kind of advice is helpful for you. Maybe you want to have those spiritual textual citations about why it is you're doing what you're doing. Then, you know, maybe this is a really good resource. I don't know. Again, uh, I don't like hate religious people. I don't think religion is stupid. I am just fascinated by all this. If nothing else is not meant to hate anyone or bash anyone's beliefs or anything like that. But those are all the thoughts that I do have for today. And I would love to know your thoughts as well. So again, put those down below in a comment. If you want to make sure to not miss out on any of the videos from me, you can go ahead and subscribe. I make videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related subjects. Sometimes we deep dive into zany websites or we react to YouTube videos or we talk about the details of what constitutes a total power exchange relationship. I don't know. Lots of subjects, lots of things to think about and discuss. Finally, if you did really enjoy this, I would love it if you guys would go over to my Patreon. A link to that will be down below. That is what supports this channel. That is what keeps all of this going. Thank you all so much. If you do already support me there, it means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great Easter day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>